Hello, new prospect. Welcome to R2B 2021 for March 13th, 2021. Hope you're doing well this day. I have to warn you, I have no idea how I'm going to get through all these texts. Uh, they are all so significant within the books uh, in which they are placed and within the Bible as a whole. Uh, and so <laughs> we could spend a lot of time on each one of these, but I'm going to have to just kind of give a brief overview of each one and, and dwell on some highlights uh, here as well. If you have further questions on things that uh, that you find in a text, feel free to drop a, uh, an email or in the comment box on Facebook or, or whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll try to answer them. But our texts for today are, uh, we have Exodus 24, uh, we've got Luke 3, or, I'm sorry, John 3, uh, then we have Job 42, the last chapter in Job, uh, and then finally 2 Corinthians 12. Why don't we start with, um, we'll start with Exodus this time. Uh, so in Exodus 24, uh, we have the end of the, the Book of the Covenant, uh, and this is where the Israelites actually accept the covenant uh, with God. And so uh, they, uh, they come, they're there at Mount Sinai, and let's just read part of it. Uh, God tells Moses, come, uh, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, which will come into play, by, by the way, later on in the Book of, of Leviticus, the 70 elders of, of Israel, and he shall worship at a distance, Moses alone, however, uh, shall come near the Lord, they shall not. So Moses is mediating for them. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. So here are all the covenants. This is all the covenant principles. This is the covenant document, the vows of the covenant. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. It's kind of like in a marriage ceremony, right? Where uh, in your marriage ceremony, you have uh, the vows read and then and then the pastor says, will you take this uh, man? Will you take this woman? And both the bride and the groom say, uh, I do, right? So this is Israel saying, I do uh, to God in this covenant relationship. Moses writes down all the words of the Lord. Uh, by the way, this is a text I often point to for, uh, to show uh, the, um, the, the, the divine origin of scripture. Notice Moses doesn't say here, Moses is the author. He says, doesn't say Moses wrote down all the words of Moses. No, he wrote down all the words of the Lord. This is something coming from God himself. Uh, this is the scriptures being written down. Again, probably referring to this, just this covenant document here, but we can extrapolate out and say it's referring to the entirety of the Bible as well, I think, divine origins. Um, and then they arose early, and now we have the, they offer some burnt offerings. And Moses takes the blood of the offering, and this is really significant. Uh, he sprinkles it on the altar with the mercy seat. Uh, that's the way in which uh, Israel was to be acceptable before God is through sacrifice, right? And then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And again, they uh, say, all the God has spoken, we will do. And then he says, uh, the text tells us, Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. That had to be a weird scene, right? Uh, and it says, and he said, when he did this, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Now that ought to ring a bell for us, uh, because in, um, in Luke, uh, a few chapters ago, a few days ago, uh, we read, of course, of the celebration of the Lord's Supper, which is a celebration of Passover. And at that Lord's Supper, Jesus passes the cup around and says, behold, the cup, uh, this cup is the blood of the new covenant. Uh, same phraseology there in the Greek as it is in the Hebrew, uh, referring to the blood of the covenant. Blood of the old covenant here, blood of the new covenant is through Jesus. The blood of the old covenant was through sacrifices that had to be ritually performed over and over again. The blood of the new covenant is a once for all sacrifice in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's what we celebrate in the Lord's Supper, uh, even as the Passover was a celebration of God's deliverance of, of Israel. Um, out of, out of Egypt. And uh, in, in both cases, uh, that blood brings you into a relationship with God and a covenant relationship with God as a people. Uh, and so that's one of the significant things about a church celebrating the Lord's Supper together is that we are, we are recognizing that through Jesus's blood, he has brought us into a relationship with each other as a church body. Okay, I spent too much long, too, too long on that. Uh, let's move on to Job. I won't spend as long on Job. So Job is wrapping up here. This is the this is the end of, of Job. It's kind of the narrative bookend uh, of Job. And uh, Job answers the Lord. And once again, he says, 
I know you can do all things. Again, he's affirming God's sovereignty and his rule, uh, which is what God has been demonstrating to him. And again, this satisfies Job. He hasn't had his questions answered. He hasn't had uh, questions answered about, about why these bad things happened to him. Uh, but he, he humbly comes before God and recognizes his sovereign control over all things. And then the Lord rebukes uh, the friends of Job. Uh, and th these are, it switches back to narrative here. You probably can notice that in your text. Uh, and the Lord restores Job, Job's fortunes. And we may be tempted, you may be tempted to read the book of Job like this and, and read, for instance, uh, chapter, chapters one and two and chapter 42 and say, well, Job got everything back in the end. And uh, so it must not have been that big of a deal. Uh, well, it was a big deal because of all the struggle and you probably noticed this, you know, having to read through all these chapters, all the struggle that we've had uh, throughout uh, set us up for this end chapter where God does restore his, his fortunes. But really, that's not the point. Uh, the point is uh, that, that uh, Job has, has uh, so to speak, passed the test. He has uh, shown that his faith is, and this is really what the book of Job about is about. It's about faith. He has his faith. Uh, in a once for all uh, or uh, overall, one overall God, a sovereign God who, who is over all things. Okay, let's move on to, uh, to 2 Corinthians then, and we'll, we'll end with, with John. So in 2 Corinthians, uh, we have Paul continue to defend his apostleship, and this is the famous passage where Paul uh, talks about boasting and weakness, and specifically boasting in the weakness of, uh, of his sufferings and kind of continuing what he talked about in chapter 11. Uh, this is also where he talks about, uh, he knows a man who's in Christ 14 years ago who was caught up in the third heaven. If, he, if anyone needed to boast, uh, that person could boast. And of course, I think he's talking about himself in the third person there. I think he's talking about himself. Um, but then he, he says, no, I'm going to, to boast in and my weaknesses. I'm content in my weaknesses. And we also here have, I think, a, a good picture of how the Christian should endure uh, suffering uh, by, by um, being content in those weaknesses and persecutions and calamities, uh, insults, Paul says, uh, specifically suffering on, uh, in the gospel, because when we are weak, Christ demonstrates his strength in that. And I know many of you have, have experienced that, haven't you? Uh, the, the, the power of Christ in the midst of our weaknesses. It's also very instructive that here we have Paul, who, of course, the greatest missionary to ever live, uh, and um, experienced things that most of us will never experience, right? Um, and, and yet he has this thorn in the flesh. We don't know what that thorn is. Uh, some people say it was his eyesight. Some people say it was some other physical malady. Some people say it was this uh, it was depression or uh, his worry over the church, or maybe it's opponents. A uh, number of different theories have been offered out there, but it's left ambiguous. And I think purposely so uh, that the, the Christians who read this afterward can, in some sense, identify with Paul. And notice what he does. He prays three times. And I don't, I don't think that's three specific times. I think that's reflective of the fact that he had continually prayed uh, for this thorn to be removed, and it never was. Uh, and, and, and yet he was content in that, in that and in remaining in that, that suffering uh, because Christ's strength was proven to be um, strong uh, in his weakness. So, and that brings us to, to John 3. Uh, so in John 3, we have perhaps one of the most famous passages in the New Testament, which is, of course, John 3, 16. Uh, and that is where uh, we have, of course, for God so loved the world. Um, now, this is a conversation with Nicodemus, and we don't have really a lot of time to go into uh, this conversation, but Nicodemus was, of course, a leader of the Pharisees, comes to Jesus uh, by night, uh, and probably for obvious reasons, um, and he wants to know uh, more about who Jesus is, even as that's what John is trying to prove in this whole entire uh, gospel, as we talked about yesterday. And, of course, all this conversation uh, is centered around this, uh, this concept of being born again, and this fours Nicodemus that we could be born again, uh, and he's thinking physical, and Jesus is thinking spiritual, 
This is where we get that terminology of born again. Uh, and this is a new life that's given to us by the Spirit of God moving in our hearts and giving us new hearts. Uh, it's what we celebrate at baptism, isn't it? That we have a new life in Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. But let's spend a little bit of time. We have to, uh, I think, for, for this text in, in John 3, 16. And I just want us to kind of follow the logic of this, right? Uh, so it says, as we know, for God so loved the world. In, in other words, he loved the world in this way. Well, what does it mean for God to love the world? Well, love, again, is that covenantal commitment, uh, that uh, dedication, that faithfulness uh, to his promises, uh, to himself, uh, to his own character. He so loved the world in this way. He loved the world in this way that, uh, and how did he demonstrate it? that he gave his only son, the expression of his love uh, for us and for, for those of us who live in this and breathe in this world is that God would give his son to us. And for one express purpose that whoever believes in him, remember John's purpose is to encourage belief in him. Whoever believes in him uh, should not perish, but have eternal life. And that's the life that John is talking about in John 20, 31, that if you believe that these things were written that you might believe that Jesus is the, son of, is the Son of God and believing have life in his name, that life is the eternal life with God himself uh, and with the Son of God, Jesus, uh, our Lord. Uh, and so uh, what a be beautiful picture of the love of God uh, and the sacrifice of the Son on our behalf uh, for us to gain uh, victory over death and eternal life with Christ. So wonderful text to kind of just think about. And it's something we read, out, we read, we memorize, we know, uh, but let's see it again with fresh eyes. Never lose the amazement of the salvation that we have in Christ on this day, March 13th, 2021. Hope you have a great rest of the day.